The 20th century was a time of incredible change, unspeakable horrors, and amazing leaps of scientific discovery. It was a century marked by events that united and divided us, from great feats to great wars, with advancements and setbacks that showed us the power of many, the power of one. A century of revolutions, evolutions, and retributions. A century made by conflicts and crimes, inventions and entertainment, politics, protests, discoveries, and disasters. We will count down the 101 events of the 20th century. Their stories form the tapestry of our history and shape the world in which we live. In this episode... The workers did one individual task as opposed to doing multiple tasks. So they were no longer craftsmen, they were workers. The United States regarded the 20th century as the American century. And yet in that American century, the first man in space was Russian. Women think that the peaceful methods just clearly aren't working. The government won't listen to their peaceful methods, so it's time for force. After the devastation of the Great War, the war to end all wars, the world started the slow march to an even greater conflict. An uneasy peace had followed the 1918 armistice and the 1919 Treaty of Versailles, where Germany was stripped of her territories and held to the high cost of war reparations. In the midst of turmoil, Hitler rose to power in Germany, promising to erase the humiliation of the nation's World War I defeat. His aim was not just regaining territories lost after Versailles, but expanding the German Empire into Eastern Europe. Germany's expansionism between 1936 and 1939, first in the Rhineland, then in Austria and Czechoslovakia, went unchallenged by the world's leaders. Hitler next turned his sights on Poland. Hitler's foreign policy against Poland had changed in the 1930s. And then in the early 1930s, he was trying to get Poland on side, chiefly because he saw the opportunity to use Poland's really quite effective armed forces against the greater enemy, which was Russia. When it became quite clear that the Poles wouldn't go for that and they were determined on their own territorial integrity, he realized he was gonna to have to dismember Poland. Hitler betrayed his agreement with the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, by occupying the whole of Czechoslovakia. The British government reacted in April 1939 by promising to aid Poland if it was attacked. Hitler signed a non-aggression pact with Stalin's Soviet Union that would keep it out of the conflict, while a secret additional protocol meant the USSR could take Finland, the Baltic states, and the eastern third of Poland. Molotov and von Ribbentrop got together and the Nazis and Communists signed a pact. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact made it possible for Hitler to go to war with Poland with the knowledge that there was a good chance this was going to lead to an extension of the war with Britain and France, because Britain and France had guaranteed Poland's territorial integrity, because he knew that he wouldn't also be faced with a war with Russia. So it was very much a piece of diplomacy. As dawn broke on the 1st of September, 1.5 million German troops rolled into Poland along its borders with German-controlled territory. The German foe begins its ruthless march of conquest and sets the stage for World War II. Simultaneously, the Luftwaffe bombed Polish airfields and German warships and U-boats attacked Polish naval forces in the Baltic Sea. Poland never really did get mobilized. The Blitzkrieg swept through like lightning. The British government replied by sending a note to the German government demanding that German forces withdraw. The demand went unanswered. On the 3rd of September, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain declared Britain at war with Germany. The immediate reaction of the Allies to the invasion of Poland was 
to declare war on Germany, but the actual practical effect of what they would do next was problematic because there was no easy way they could get troops and material in to assist Poland. So in effect, although for all these grand statements of support, Poland was left to its fate by the Allies. Poland's fate was invasion, occupation and division. The first casualty of a war without parallel. The long-term ramifications of Hitler's invasion of Poland was the start of a European war, and ultimately it did lead to the start of the Second World War, a war that eventually would result in Germany's defeat. An invention that would be both celebrated and reviled. It would revolutionize the car industry and set us on the path to mass production. The horseless carriage first appeared in the late 19th century. Cars were handmade. They were beautifully produced by craftsmen who labored over them for, for many, many weeks. And if you can imagine, they were chauffeur driven. Uh, if you could afford a car, you could afford a chauffeur. Ford saw the potential in the automobile industry and dreamed of putting everyone behind the wheel of a car. His first car, he called it a quadricycle. He began with an idea that most people thought wouldn't work. Henry Ford first started making the Model T in 1908, and at that time he produced a car that was strikingly different to the luxury cars of the day. It was small, it was lightweight, it had a, a small four-cylinder engine, and uh, people criticised it because they didn't think it was strong enough. But it had incredibly um, strong axles and leaf springs made of Vanadian steel and made it a fantastic four-wheel drive vehicle. Unlike other cars, the Model T featured interchangeable parts, which meant that every Model T produced on the assembly line used the same valves, gas tanks and tyres, so they could be assembled in an organised and repetitive fashion, which increased reliability and lowered the cost. Ford's greatest innovation and cost saver was how the parts were put together. So Henry thought, I've got the car, now how can I create it and build it much faster? So he had a good think about it and he was really big on sort of time and motion studies and he thought, oh, if I can get this car made quicker, we could make more of them and sell them cheaper. So that was his ultimate aim, to bring the car to the masses and he could only do that by making them more cheaply. Ford had been impressed with the efficiency of slaughterhouse assembly lines and grain warehouse conveyor belts in the Midwest and they did it with a series of conveyor belts and amazing gravity-fed slides, and, and the work was all brought to the car itself, and the workers did one individual task as opposed to doing multiple tasks. So they were no longer craftsmen, they were workers. Assembly time was sped up from more than 12 hours to 90 minutes. By 1918, half of the cars on US roads were Ford Model Ts. Ford's factories have been credited and blamed with accelerating the population shift from rural areas to cities. Another of Ford's visions that would become enshrined in the industrial labour movement was the five-day, 40-hour work week. Ford championed hours being reduced, believing leisure time was not only beneficial and valuable for his workers, but also something to be enjoyed by all social and economic classes. So he had three eight-hour shifts and ran the factory 24 hours a day. So a Model T came off the production line every one and a half minutes, and it was just phenomenal. It made such a huge difference. Other industries adopted Ford's production model, and by the end of the 20th century, all mass-produced items, from tinned food to microprocessors and teddy bears, rolled off assembly lines all around the world. Gotta go now. In 1962, the United States and the Soviet Union faced off, with the fate of the world hanging in the balance. 14 days in which the threat of nuclear war was more real and present than at any other moment in history. The Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 was the most dangerous episode in the history of the Cold War when it seemed likely that the Cold War would become a hot war. 
On October 14, 1962, an American plane flying over Cuba had photographed medium-range Soviet missiles being assembled. Tensions had existed between Cuba and the United States since Castro's communist takeover in 1959. But Cuba was, of course, on good terms with the Soviet Union. The Soviets were installing ballistic missiles 90 miles off the coast of Florida. Castro may be the figurehead of Cuba, but in fact, he's a mere pawn in a Soviet gambit which threatens world peace. The American president, John F. Kennedy, was faced with choosing how to respond to this threat. When he listed all the options that he could take, they were all military options. So what is a good thing is that Kennedy didn't make a snap decision that he was prepared to keep an open mind and be prepared to change his mind. After much debate with his team of advisors, Kennedy decided on a naval blockade of Cuba. So at 7 p.m. on the 22nd of October, 1962, Kennedy delivers a major television and radio address in which he says to the American people two things. Firstly, you need to know that there are Russian nuclear missiles in Cuba. And secondly, I'm going to respond with a naval blockade. The path we have chosen for the present is full of hazards, but the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. Soviet ships approached the blockade, and the world held its breath. The Soviet ship stopped, and a Soviet submarine backed off when the US dropped warning charges around it. Letters passed between the leaders with demands and counter-demands. But the spectre of mutually assured destruction meant that neither wanted a nuclear war. On October 28th, the removal of nuclear weapons from Cuba was agreed. To the public, Kennedy's show of force had made the Soviet Union dismantle and remove their missiles. But unbeknownst to them, the Soviet Union had asked for something in return. America complied, removing their own missiles from Turkey. What's interesting to consider are the broader implications of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in terms of Kennedy, in terms of the Kennedy presidency, I think it is a turning point in his presidency. And I think what the Cuban Missile Crisis does is it furnishes him with a visceral understanding of the dangers of the nuclear age. These new weapons are not in your interest. They contribute nothing to your peace and well-being. They can only undermine it. And if you look at the final year of his presidency, the final year of his life, you see that Kennedy shifts. He begins to look to find ways to reduce Cold War tension. Although communications improved with the new hotline between Washington and Moscow, tensions remained between the two superpowers, and the Cold War continued for three decades after the incident, but never again to return to the brink of nuclear war. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere, and we hope around the world. At the dawn of the 20th century, two brothers' ingenuity would turn a flight of fancy into a viable mode of transportation, one that would bring the world to our fingertips. Orville and Wilbur Wright were not the first people to fly, but their achievement at Kitty Hawk in 1903, the first control-powered flight, was a vital milestone in the development of aviation. Originally bicycle makers, they began to wonder how a pilot might balance an aircraft in the air, just as a cyclist balances his bicycle on the road. The biggest thing they found was that the ratio of span to width of the wing that was in all the experimental data from other inventors was wrong. And that was the key to setting up a, an aircraft that could fly well. Then to, for control, they'd watch the birds and notice the birds had adjusted their wingtip feathers when they wanted to turn. And so they worked out a system of warping the wings to change the lift on the wingtips so the aircraft could roll as it turned. Wilbur and Orville Wright gave the glider a water-cooled engine of their own design and two chain-driven eight-and-a-half-foot pusher propellers. Then on the 17th of December, 1903, 
they made the first sustained controlled flights in a powered aircraft along a windswept beach in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They were in the air for 59 seconds. They did four flights. The first one was 12 seconds. The last one was 59 seconds, and it travelled about 120 metres. It was the first time an aircraft had taken off, attained a higher altitude and landed again under its own power. It proved that flight was possible. It proved their theories, that their calculations were correct, and you could build on that. And it fired enthusiasm around the world. So in the 10 years that followed, there were hundreds of people building aeroplanes that worked. Following the Wright brothers came a roster of pioneers and daredevils whose feats advanced aviation and aircraft design. Alcock and Brown, Lindbergh, Blairot, Kingsford Smith, Amy Johnson and Amelia Earhart. Their legacy is global air travel and an aviation industry that has become one of the biggest, most innovative and most important industries in the world. It's hard to imagine what our life today would be without aeroplanes. It certainly reduced the distance between peoples, not just physically, but also in their understanding of each other. The freedom that flight offers us extends much farther than merely breaking the physical bonds of Earth. In the dark days following the Second World War, a new international movement emerged. One seeking to enshrine the same fundamental human rights for all people, regardless of their gender, race or religious observance. To a world recently devastated by war, the horror of the Nazis' gas chambers and concentration camps could not be ignored. Obviously, coming out of that, people were concerned with how to ensure that it didn't happen again. The idea was that the Nazi regime had been a grotesque violator of human rights. So if you wanted to prevent a Nazi Germany from ever arising again, you had to have a basically a list of the rights that every human being was entitled to. And so, fundamentally, human rights were about creating a structure for peace after World War II. The first challenge for the international community was deciding the role governments would play in respecting, protecting and promoting human rights. The League of Nations was replaced by the creation of the United Nations in 1945, and its primary goal of bolstering international peace was underpinned by the creation of agencies tasked with ensuring no one would ever again be unjustly denied life, freedom, food and shelter. One of the most vocal champions of the cause was Eleanor Roosevelt. Mrs. Roosevelt is assured of a very warm welcome on her visit to Britain to unveil President Roosevelt's statue in London on the 12th of April. She was, of course, the wife of the former U.S. President, the late uh, U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, and so his successor, Harry Truman, appointed her as a U.S. representative to the U.N., and from that position, building on her very long history of engagement in humanitarian causes and her very high public profile. She was appointed to head the Human Rights Commission that did the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Over the course of a year, the Commission concluded its priority should be developing a human rights declaration rather than a treaty. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights may well become the International Magna Carta of all men everywhere. Presented to the United Nations on the 10th of December 1948, it codified 30 articles of human rights into a single document. Its name, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, emphasizing a set of standard of rights for all people everywhere. Although not binding, the declaration became a part of the fabric of the UN itself. Despite this, the second half of the 20th century continued to be marred by human rights abuses around the world with no UN action. We know that there's lots of wonderful aspirational pieces of paper articulating these human rights, but enforcement has been weak. The UN's first special court was created in 1993 to investigate charges of genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The UN investigation led to a four-year trial in The Hague, 
one of the most important war crimes cases since the Nuremberg trials. It's changed the way we think. We talk about global justice now in the language of human rights. Every country basically accepts the principle that when you develop a foreign policy, you have to take into account how other countries treat their own citizens. That's a really revolutionary change. In the first half of the 20th century, poliomyelitis, or polio, was a word that struck fear into the hearts of parents. A scourge of children worldwide, one that modern science could defeat. At its peak, polio paralyzed or killed more than half a million people worldwide every year. In the United States, the 1952 epidemic became the worst outbreak in the nation's history, with close to 58,000 cases reported. The reasons why that happened are counterintuitive. It was because of improved sanitation, it was because of us living in cities, it was because of industrialization. And what that meant is that there was less exposure, particularly to children, to certain viruses so they didn't gain an immunity that they might have in the past. Children were most susceptible, with effects ranging from fever and limb stiffness to severe paralysis. Perhaps the worst feature of the disease has been a feeling of hopelessness at the prospect of many months in the grip of paralysis. Future US President Franklin Roosevelt contracted the disease when he was 39, spurring his interest in finding a cure. His March of Dimes Foundation backed research into the disease, giving grants to scientists. One of the scientists to receive funding was Jonas Salk, who began studying the disease in 1947. In 1952, after successfully inoculating thousands of monkeys, Salk began the risky step of testing the vaccine on humans. He found that his vaccine was effective but he had difficulty in getting permission to test it on humans. And the reason was there had been previous uh, polio vaccines tested that resulted in deaths. Also, he was a, a man who had the courage of his convictions and he believed that he had found the vaccine that people needed. And because of the epidemic-like situation with polio, he wanted to act quickly. So he did what other scientists have done before him, but not very often, he tested it on himself and his family. In April 1954, trials were extended to nearly two million school children, Salk's polio pioneers. These were the largest clinical trials for a public health experiment in American history. The vaccine has been subjected to the most stringent safety measures by the manufacturers and the Medical Research Council. Salk's vaccine was licensed for use in April 1955, the same day it was announced to the world's media as safe, effective and potent. By 1962, the number of annual polio cases dropped from 45,000 to just 910. Over in Russia, another American scientist Dr. Albert Sabin was working on what would become a more effective treatment as it could be taken orally. Once Sabin's oral vaccine became available in 1962, it quickly supplanted Salk's injected vaccine. Like Salk, Sabin also gifted his vaccine to the public good. The two vaccines had largely eradicated the polio virus from most parts of the world by the end of the 20th century. Well, I think vaccination was extraordinary, the impact it had. It's actually taking away from societies life-changing or life-destroying uh, diseases and making it better for everyone. And I think polio is a brilliant example of that. For as long as we've looked at the night sky, we have dreamed of visiting the stars. In the 1950s, humanity would strive to make this dream a reality.
With the world settling into a Cold War, outer space became the frontier where the USA and the USSR test their might against each other. The space race began in earnest in 1955, when both countries announced they would launch satellites out of the Earth's atmosphere into orbit. Both the Soviet Union and the United States officially proclaimed that they were agencies of human progress, the United States making the world freer and the Soviet Union making the world equal. So in that respect, they were very similar. But that meant, of course, that they always compared themselves uh, very closely with one another. The Soviets won the first leg when on the 4th of October 1957, they launched Sputnik 1, putting the first human-made object into space. We in the West had expected that the United States would be the first. Well, now the Russians have done it. They've done it first and they've done it with complete success. All Americans were raised with the idea that they were the world's leading power and Sputnik ended that security. They were horrified. About the size of a beach ball, the device weighed 83.6 kilograms, was only a half a meter wide and carried four radio antennas to broadcast signals back to Earth. The Soviets caught them by surprise in more ways than one. It caught them by surprise in terms of um, just doing it for the first time. It caught them by surprise in terms of the size of the satellite. Sputnik orbited the Earth for 96 days before burning up in the atmosphere. With Sputnik's successful launch, the race was now on in earnest and America rushed to catch up. On the 12th of April, 1961, Russian cosmonaut Major Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space. The United States regarded the 20th century as the American century. And by the time Kennedy became president, it regarded itself as the most advanced, the most progressive society in the world. And yet in that American century, the first man in space was Russian. John F. Kennedy announced to Congress in 1961 that he intended to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. The dramatic achievements in space which occurred in recent weeks should have made clear to us all, as did the Sputnik in 1957, the impact of this adventure on the minds of men everywhere who are attempting to make a determination of which road they should take. And by the end of the decade, two American men had stepped onto the moon. Just imagine before Sputnik, there was the Earth, 300,000 kilometers away was the moon. And apart from the occasional passing small pieces of rock, there was nothing. Sputnik for the first time was something else in orbit around the Earth. And that has had enormous implications and has led to incredible opportunities. But it opens up the possibility of Star Wars. Thus, if there were a war, a great war between great powers, satellite weapons and anti-satellite weapons would be used. Satellites would be used to destroy satellites and so on. So it opens up a whole new dimension to war. The US had taken the lead in the space race, but every step and every achievement has followed a path first blazed by Sputnik. In China, the 20th century began with the fall of the last imperial dynasty. The newly formed Fragile Republic could not withstand the pressure of internal division and invasion by Japan. Then, in the wake of World War II, a new China would be formed. The World War ended in 1945, but China was not free from conflict or foreign occupation. There was this sense that, all right, the Japanese have been beaten, but they're still around. <laughs> the Americans are still here. We've got Soviets in the north. Uh, when is this? There, there's an anxiety, a real angst around this kind of sense of uh, when are we going to get our peace dividend? Two opposing forces that have been contesting control since 1927 launched full-scale civil war. The nationalist inheritors of the Republican government, led by Chiang Kai-shek, and the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong. Initially, the far larger and much better equipped nationalist force held sway. It changed slowly, but it changed dramatically. Through 1948 particularly, the Communist Red Army built success on success. Today, 
communism has swept like a red tide over this ancient civilization from the old capital of Peking down to the Yangtze and Nanking. When every national and international attempt at conciliation failed, Chiang Kai-shek was finally forced into exile. Millions had fought, perhaps six million were casualties. The victory of Mao and the Communist Party was complete. And on October the 1st, 1949, in Tiananmen Square, Mao declared the People's Republic of China. There is a sense, I think, in the population of at least a passive hope that things would be different, that this new People's Republic of China would take up the mantle that the Republic of China had sort of left behind of China as being a, a world power, having peace and unification. China signed a treaty with the Soviet Union and proposed to follow their example, building their new nation as quickly as they could. They would industrialize and improve food production over a five-year plan. Most of the developed world, led by the United States, continued to recognize Chiang Kai-shek on the island of Taiwan as the Chinese head of government. They blocked the People's Republic entry into the United Nations in favor of Chiang Kai-shek for more than 20 years, which served only to help Mao tighten his grip on power. The Communist Party as a body, at the Central Committee, had lots of revolutionary experience, lots of military experience. And so they were able to take advantage of the nationalist mistakes during the Second World War and after, during the Civil War, paint the nationalists as puppets of America in the late 1940s, which, financially speaking, was true. But the People's Republic that Mao declared in October 1949 had to be acknowledged as a reality which was finally done during President Nixon's trip to meet Mao in 1972. I have taken this action because of my profound conviction that all nations will gain from a reduction of tensions and a better relationship between the United States and the People's Republic of China. It's an epic impact. China's participation in world organizations, uh, the United Nations, anti-proliferation treaties, global climate uh, accords, for example, financial dealings, uh, where by the 1980s, the Chinese economy has grown, the Chinese model has expanded, and uh, we're now today with 1.3 billion Chinese and a major market for any country's goods and a huge cultural power as well. At the beginning of the Second World War, countries like Great Britain, France, and the Netherlands were still the greatest maritime empires of the world. The war would change that. In its wake, a movement towards self-government would sweep across continents, ending the imperial age. The movement to independence was at its strongest in the Indian subcontinent where many have been living under British rule for 200 years. The Second World War had a massive impact. Britain is under far more pressure and is less able to maintain its relationship with the subcontinent. So they're more willing, perhaps, to, to give up um, their, their colonial holdings. But at the same time, the pressure builds within India during that time, and there's a sense that, actually, we've put up with this long enough. So by the time you reach 1945, it's really expected that independence will be imminent. Britain, under the Labour government, committed to implementing welfare programs which would make the maintenance of empire even less affordable. They were determined to relinquish control of India as soon as possible. The last Viceroy's task was to assess and implement the withdrawal. And all the familiar activities to be witnessed in this teeming city were being carried on as usual. But there was an undercurrent of pent-up excitement for everyone knew that India, Hindustan India, was now to be free and independent. The problem was that though the population of the subcontinent was largely united against the British, it was not united amongst itself. The most dangerous fault line ran between the Muslim and Hindu communities. A way out of this antagonism seemed to be a redrawing of the map, petitioning the subcontinent into Muslim and Hindu majority nations. 
The actual decision to partition is made in the middle of 1947. The line is drawn by a man called Cyril Radcliffe from Britain. He's never been east of Paris before. He's brought in and has six weeks to draw a partition line for the two states that are Muslim majorities and are considered appropriate for partition. On August 15th, 1947, the British left the subcontinent. India and the newly created Pakistan were officially independent nations. We trust, as do all responsible Indians, that this great experiment will be successful. The result of that, that that line only gets announced right at the last minute, there's real doubt about which side of the line they will end up on. So across the whole of North India, there is a vast movement of people, estimated to be about 10 to 12 million people that are on the move in, in the middle of 1947. And they're moving Muslims to the northwest and to the northeast to try and enter the new areas of uh, Pakistan, and Hindus and Sikhs leaving the northwest and the northeast and moving into what they hope will be India and where they think they will be safer. Violence had been growing and would ultimately result in one million deaths, many of them people moving on foot to find safety. This is one of the most destructive, distressing events of the 20th century. And I think most immediately that is overlooked, essentially. For the British, it's very much in their interest to portray this as a success as a moment of handing over, handing back power, the, the fulfilment of their uh, colonial plans. So that picture that's really presented in, in Britain in the, in the 40s and into the 50s of the successful end of empire with a promise fulfilled, that's very powerful and I think that lasts for a long time and means that the violence, the horror is really overlooked. A decade after the First World War, another crisis gripped the world. It was the bursting of a financial bubble, and it would contribute to a broader economic collapse, a Great Depression. The post-war decade of the 1920s had been a period of increasing prosperity. The United States particularly emerged from the First World War with an economic strength that was unrivaled. First of all, arming the Allies and then, uh, towards the end of the war, joining the war. The war effort had created an enormous, sort of superheated American economy, which was churning out enormous amounts of, of manufactured and agricultural goods, all of which got very high price markets from the government or from the Allies who were desperate for military or agricultural supplies. The Roaring Twenties, with its jazz clubs, prohibition, illegal drinking and daring fashions was a time of excitement. The US stock market soared and flourished. Speculators bought into Wall Street on margin, paying only part of a stock's worth when they bought it and the rest when they sold it. But of course, if the stock fell, they could never recoup the deferred amount of the purchase price. Debt was everywhere. Well, a bit like organised crime and prohibition, the speculation economy became a symbol of the 1920s and the swinging 20s, a period of, of very ostentatious and definite economic growth. That environment of risk and speculation came crashing down on the 29th of October, 1929. In history's worst panic, over 16 million shares are dumped on the market. Over $14 billion go with them, and so goes the confidence of a nation. Billions of dollars were lost, wiping out thousands of investors. Those that had bought on the margins were forced to pay up on stocks that were now worthless. The flow-on was quick and savage. The banks, particularly in rural areas, struggled to keep their doors open, causing depositors to panic and withdraw their money. In just three years, more than 5,000 banks shut their doors, threatening the entire US banking system. If you were an ordinary person with a small amount of life saving in a bank account and your bank collapsed, you'd lost your money. It was gone. And so that, of course, had an absolutely chilling effect on people's economic well-being and their ability to spend. And you quickly moved from a short-term crash 
into a long-term structural depression. The country's largest banks called in their short-term foreign loans, showing how interconnected the world's economies have become and turning a shock into a shockwave that travelled the world. When the worldwide depression hit the United States, the fact that it was international, that no people were spared, meant very little to the man suddenly without work. As national economies struggled to survive, political instability and the rise of both left and right-wing extremists started the march towards another world war. The Berlin Wall created a physical and ideological divide, literally cutting a path through the historic German capital. It embodied the standoff between world superpowers for almost 45 years. A symbol of division, its fall would make a powerful statement of change. At the end of the Second World War, Germany was divided into four occupation zones. The Soviets in the east and the US, Britain and France in the west. After the three Allied zones were unified into a single unit, the Federal Republic of Germany, commonly known as West Germany, tensions with the Soviets increased. For those struggling under the communist system, West Berlin promised a better life. More than 2.5 million Germans fled from east to west over the next decade following the war. To halt the exodus, East German soldiers laid almost 50 kilometers of barbed wire barrier through the heart of Berlin during the night of August 12, 1961. Three days later, a concrete wall had begun to be built to replace the barbed wire. The barricade had previously been a comparatively flimsy affair. Now it was to be impregnable, apparently. The communists did the West an enormous favor. They built the biggest advertisement possible for free market democracy and the West used that wall in its propaganda. And indeed, it developed because, of course, on the Western side, people could graffiti on it. And the perfectly ordinary people, they graffitied their own liberal and libertarian messages on the wall. And it became a great celebration for 28 years of human freedom, quite spontaneously. By the late 1980s, demands for greater personal freedoms in East Germany were growing as Europe's political landscape changed. With public opposition rising, East German officials tried to stem protests by announcing a softening of the travel regime. The evening of the 9th of November, 1989, a government spokesman announced by mistake that people would be able to travel more freely immediately. Today we have decided to introduce measures permitting every citizen of the DDR to leave for the Federal Republic by any crossing points. A few hours later, confused guards were faced with growing crowds demanding to be let out. By 10.45 p.m., guards opened the gates and tens of thousands of East Germans poured out. Celebrations continued long into the night in front of and on top of the wall. The fall of the wall, that had profound effects. It meant, of course, that the great symbolic benefit for the West was gone, but it didn't really need it anymore. It then conquered East Germany and Eastern Europe, with the, that's what the expansion of the EU is all about, imposing the free market and democracy on Eastern Europe and turning all Europe into one capitalist democratic space. It was a moment signaling the last throes of the Cold War. Reunification talks began soon after, and a year later, on the 3rd of October 1990, East and West Germany were united for the first time in 45 years. In the early years of the 20th century, the rights of British citizens were divided on gender lines. Women were fighting passionately for change, a battle that would see its share of tragedy. Before the Great War, the issue that occupied women in Britain and many other parts of the world was suffrage, the right to vote. In England, 
the movement split into factions. The mild-mannered suffragists, who were willing to work with the government and fundraise for their effort, and the more violent suffragettes who relied on hunger strikes and public attacks to further their cause. Their motto, deeds not words, separated them from their sister group. Women think that the peaceful methods just clearly aren't working. The government won't listen to their peaceful methods, so it's time for force. A minority of women, and they're the ones we called the suffragettes, they were the ones breaking windows, chaining themselves to railings, and also, you'll hear often that they did things like set fire to post boxes. Emily Wilding Davison was a governess, passionate about the suffragette movement. She became a full-time member of the group, quit her teaching job and threw herself off a balcony to try to draw attention to the plight of the suffragettes. On Derby Day at Epsom 1913, she walked out onto the racetrack and in her last great act for suffrage, tried to attach the suffragettes' colours onto King George V's horse. Within seconds, Emily Davidson had been trampled to death. A return train ticket in her purse, found after the event, suggests that she had not thought she would die on the track that day, but her past behaviour indicated she was at peace with the possibility of becoming a martyr. Women in England chose to halt their suffragette efforts during the First World War as a gesture of patriotism. But following the armistice, they resumed their agitation until a limited franchise was granted in 1918. The right was extended to all women aged over 21 in 1928, by which time Emily Davison had become a symbol for the suffrage movement, and more broadly, the women's movement, which over the course of the 20th century, achieved advances in career, academic opportunities, and participation in government. 1931, and on the terrace of the House of Commons, a group of new MPs being introduced by Lady Astor. The transformation of views, it shows how a fundamental political tenet can change. And I think it's the first big example in the 20th century. There are others like changing attitudes to race and immigration, to gay people, but women's suffrage is the first. There are many heroines of the suffragette movement, best known of those who were martyred to their cause was Emily Wilding Davison. At the heart of Nazi policy and Hitler's personal politics was so-called race theory. It fueled a campaign of marginalization, terror and control. Its primary target and victim, the Jew. In September of 1935, the viciously discriminatory Nuremberg laws were passed and the elimination of Jewish people from positions of influence, authority and respect gathered pace. Jewish books were burned, Jewish businesses were boycotted and it became illegal for Jews to marry German citizens. Jews were becoming victims of increasing violence leading up to the 1938 night of broken glass, Kristallnacht. While stories of wanton beatings and bullyings in the darkened streets added to the terror. After 1933, when the Nazis had seized power, anti-Semitism became the doctrine of the state. And that meant it was immediately translated into praxis. Jews in Germany experienced a bombardment of public anti-Semitic symbols, particularly in regional areas, and it became clear for them that they were not any more welcome in Germany. So prior to the Crystal Night, there was already a wave of anti-Semitism in Germany, which excluded Jews from society. Marking the anniversary of Hitler's Beer Hall Putsch, orders were sent out around 1.20 a.m to capitalize on an event in Paris. Two days earlier, a young Jewish man, Herschel Grinspun, had shot a German embassy official, Ernst von Rath, whose wounds resulted in his death. The German government used Grinspun's act as a cover. They orchestrated attacks, then claimed they had been the result of spontaneous public outrage. 
In the night of the 9th and 10th of November, synagogues in Germany, Austria, and the Sudetenland were burned down, raised to the ground. Jewish shops were ransacked, properties and apartments were attacked, and approximately 30,000 Jewish males were arrested and sent into the great concentration camps to enforce the pressure upon Jews to leave Germany as quickly as possible. Under direction from their government, the German police and the Hitler Youth defiled cemeteries and hospitals, forcing people out of their homes and forcing them to commit humiliating acts. Their directives told them to target Jewish buildings. Laws were tightened even further. Jewish property was given to Aryan business owners. Jewish children were barred from school. Many Jews had hoped that the democracy would return to Germany and that they could continue to live in Germany. But the event of Kristallnacht, they realized quite clearly that time has come to leave, that they had no right anymore to live in Germany. And Kristallnacht was also the turning point for the Nazi policy on the so-called twisted road to Auschwitz. Within a year of Kristallnacht, the Second World War began drawing Jews of Central and Eastern Europe into the Nazi madness, creating a holocaust that took the lives of six million Jewish people.